Hey, as we roll into today, I want to read a scripture. I'm going to share some thoughts, and and uh, I hope all the thoughts make sense because I'm doing something I, I've never done in like 25 years of preaching. I'm actually only using a little bit of a scratching notes on a little pad. I've preached, I've written down word for word everything I've taught for 25 years. So this is new for me, so I'm a little nervous. But if we're all, thank you, love you. If you know me, know I'm a little OCD. So I love things orderly. In fact, I was here on Friday making sure all the roads were perfectly straight. They're all messed up now after the first service. But want to make sure it's straight. But I'm telling you, that to me, if I want our church to get out of the comfort zone, I've got to get out of my own comfort zone. So, so today, join us on this journey as we talk from God's Word about what it is to have a move of God. I want to see God move in ways He's never moved in our church ever, ever before. I want to see God do things He's never, ever done before in our church. I want to see God do things in your life and through your life that will blow your own mind because you're like, I can't believe I'm doing this. So, so I want to promise you a couple little things, right? First is this. I, we don't want to be weird either as God does stuff. There's a lot of weird people out there. In fact, the thing that drives me insane about weird people is they don't know they're weird. But it's always been weird people that got you in life. But I don't want my church to be weird. If I invite my friends to church and my church is weird, listen, Lady Gaga, who's weird, sells millions and millions of records. And yet people drawn to that, and yet we can't have a little weird in God's house. I'm just saying. If people can run to Lady Gaga for, you know, whatever she sings, I don't even know what she sings. I just know she's like Gaga. That's all I know. That's some Super Bowl halftime show. But people are drawn to that. So it's okay to be a little weird, but not really weird. So we're going to be a little weird in church. So... And weird to us simply means this. It's abnormal because we have yet to experience it. So anything that's new is often considered weird. Because it's new, it's unfamiliar ground. So we're all going to go on this journey of unfamiliar ground together. But I love this passage in 2 Chronicles 7.14. It's a great verse of scripture. It says this, If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves... There's a word we don't hear very often, right? Humbling yourself does not mean lowering yourself. It means seeing yourself as you are, but also seeing him as he is. And when you have the right view of God, the view of yourself is usually pretty right. See, we don't have to compare ourselves to each other. We compare ourselves to him, and that should humble us immediately because he's perfect and holy in all his ways. Because I'd say, humble themselves and pray. There's a novel idea, right? And seek my face and turn from their wicked ways. I will hear from heaven and heal their land. I and mean, what a powerful verse about revival. That if we do the right thing, notice there's a condition proposed. If my people, anybody God's people in the house? If my people who are called by my name will do this, the condition proposed, here's the response that God gives. If we walk in our calling, then God promises, hey, if you're humble, you seek my face, you're hungry for me, and you're holy, I'm going to heal your land. I don't know where you need healing today. Where do you need God to do a supernatural miracle, a breakthrough in your life? All you got to do is be the people of God that approach him as you are, knowing who he is. But I love the next two verses of Scripture. Every time I've heard this passage preached, They've only preached 2 Chronicles 7, 14. I think 15 is the gold in the story. Here it is. My eyes will be open and my ears attentive to every prayer made in this place. That scripture is talking about the temple of God. That God, when his people come together for the right reasons, the right agenda, they have the right heart, that God will hear every prayer that's prayed in that place and respond. Now, I don't know if you know this or not, but God is here in this place, 
He's in this place to meet every single need. And he promises, if my people are humble, they pray, they seek my face, and they turn from their wickedness, then my ear will hear every prayer that's prayed for me in my house. I don't know if you sense that or not, but it's building. And the next verse even is like there's gold and then there's platinum gold. Here's 2 Chronicles 7, 16, for I have chosen this temple. I've chosen this temple. He didn't say I chose another temple. I chose this temple. And when I was reading this verse, I was thinking like, wait a minute. This is so awesome how God is. And this is those weird moments you have. Here's one of those weird moments. I'm thinking, wait a minute. We are sitting in a former Jewish temple. And he says, in this temple I've chosen, I have set it apart. Church Unleashed, let me tell you, God has chosen this church. He set this church apart for a great destiny filled with purpose and potential. I don't know what you came to do today in church, but I know I came to lift up the name of Jesus. In this temple, in this place, in this space, God wants to do the supernatural. So, yeah, we may get a little weird. I'm weird anyway, so what's the difference? But I love that last line of that verse. I will watch over it, for it is very dear to my heart. When I think about how much Mary and I love this church, it is no comparison to how much God loves this church. He loved the church so much he gave his son to die for the church so that you and I can have hope in heaven. See, I believe that when we follow the prescription of God, God always responds to us in the way we need, not always the way we want. So when I was praying three weeks ago over this message today, because Mary and I have been sensing in our hearts that God is shifting some things within our church. When I was praying over this, the Lord gave me this thing. I wrote it in my journal. What we need is a revival of the word of God. Now, track with me on this. I love worship, but worship is not the power of God. Romans 1.16 is clear. For I am not ashamed of the preaching of the cross, for it is the power of God. The thing declared to be the power of God is the word of God. Hebrews 4.12, for the word of God is full of life and power. It discerns your thoughts and attitudes. The word of God is his story to us. Worship is is our feeling and adoration back to him. I don't need my worship. I need his word. And so as we dive in to this thing, we are committed to the word of God. It is the word of God that directs our lives. It is the word of God that tells us what we should and should not do. It does not matter how we feel. Yeah, the pastor, you know, I really feel like I ought to leave my wife and go be with this other person. The Bible tells us not to do that. So if you want to do that, you're basically saying, I don't want to follow the word. That's why we need a revival of the word. Because if we all do what we feel, we'll all do anything we want. And there'll be no, no move of God because it's all predicated on the word of God. So I mean, I feel like God, I just... You know, I just feel like this would be better for me. Let me tell you, the grass is always greener on the other side until you get there and you realize they've been spray painting their grass so you get deceived into going, oh, come on. Is that not the truth? I mean, that coworker that caught your attention. You go, like, hmm, you think she wakes up like it? No, her breasts stank, her hair's all over the place. I'm just saying. You know, man, I just feel like, you know, I just, I just need to, I need to feel free. Just light me up a little bit. I'm going to go through every generation of what we call it. Give me a little bit of Mary Jane. I just, just need to, I just, oh, I just, oh. The Bible talks against that kind of belief. 
and I get, I think we have, but it's good, but it's legal. I don't care if it's legal in New York. I don't care if it's legal in California. I care if it's legal in God's word. Come on now. That's all I'm talking about. But I feel at the end of the day, I don't really care how you feel about what God's word says. Come on now. It's God's word all or nothing. Oh, but you know, I just, I just you know, I get to feel like, you know, I just want to get to know them. You know, I'm single. And I just got to get to know them in every way possible. You know what I'm saying? We got kids in here, so you know. I just, you know, I just got to, and then, it, then you're not satisfied. I just want to get to know this person, too. How would you like to be the spouse at the end of that chain? Hey, babe, let me give you the leftovers of everything I gave to every other person out there. Come on, let me just talk about it. Let's be honest. That's how you may feel, but that's not what the Word says. The Word says you ought to save yourself from marriage. You ought to wait for the mate that's straight from God, the one that God has designed for your life. And if someone has to get you to that level for you to accept them, dump the chum. Just saying, dump the chum. Come on, moms and dads will be. That's why we need a revival of the word. Because if we don't know the word, we don't know how to live. It is the word that is our roadmap to life. It gives us the directives of our life. The reason why we all get jacked up is because we don't read the Word. I made a bad decision. I didn't know that was in the Bible. Open the Bible. Read the Bible. You'll discover everything God has for you, all the blessings He has for you, all the great things that God wants to do in your life is in the Word. That's why we need a revival of the Word. We need the Word to be revived within our soul. So the word revival, though, is not in the Bible. It's not a word that's in the Bible, but the concept is. The word revival uh, comes from two Latin words, re and vivere. Re meaning again, vivere, live. Again, live. Or to live again. For something to live again, it first has to be. So when God wants to say and do something in his church, it means something in his church or in the people in the church, something died. I believe the pursuit of God has died in our culture today. Because we pursue everything else but Jesus. We run here and we run there. We will drop $200, $300 on tickets to go see an entertainer, but we won't even drop two bucks in the offering plate. I'm gonna a little bit. Right? I mean, what does that tell you? It tells you where your priority is. I love Jesus. Have you read his word this week? Or has this become a thing that sits on your shelf waiting to be discovered? See, when you read God's word, you sometimes get a little offended. Because you read things you don't like because you see yourself. I remember being asked by a pastor recently, he said, man, how do you keep your devotionals fresh? How do you always read and you're always discovering new things? Because I said this to him, I said, I don't read the Bible anymore. I let the Bible read me. I think too many people are reading the Bible instead of letting the Bible read their life, to look at their life through the lens of God's Word. And when I let the Bible read me, I sometimes get offended. I don't like everything it says. Because sometimes, ouch, I can't say that, I can't do that. I can't think that. And sometimes it's hard to embrace that. Come on, is that not real talk? But sometimes it's there for that, for us to discover how we can be better people, better Christians, and to be better, you know, people with each other. But now here's the thing. Here's what often happens to people. They're offended when they read the word, but yet God is offended when we don't read the word. They hear God, I gave you my story so that your life could be transformed and you let it just sit on your shelf or you bring it as a decorative item when you walk into church so people who see, ooh, look, they got the big Bible. They're super spiritual. I mean, they don't got the thin Bible. 
small print. They got extra large, supersized print. They must be holy. See, the truth is, the Bible reads us, and when the Bible reads us, it reveals things to us. That's why we need a revival of the Word of God. Let me ask you today, what is dead faith? Maybe your faith is dead. Maybe your trust in God is questionable. Maybe your faith is buried in the past. Good news about that. God doesn't need a lot of your faith. He only needs a mustard seed of faith. Something very small. I believe God wants to move in your life. In the New Testament, we find the word revive. And in the Greek, which is what the New Testament was fashioned in, the word revive actually means resuscitate. To breathe life in. I think we need God to breathe in us. It doesn't matter whether you're first time in church or you've been in church your whole life. We all need God to breathe on us. Every single day of our life, we need the breath of God in our lives, the breath of God in our families when we're at work. See, but I think there's too many Christians that have signed a DNR, a do not revive. I don't know who that was, but I love you too. It literally is best seen this way. Hey, I want God to show up in my life, but he's got to show up on my terms, DNR. God doesn't show up on our terms. He shows up on his terms. The prophet Isaiah said, wait a minute, wait a minute. What right does the clay have to tell the potter what to do with the clay? It is the potter who shapes the clay. So when I go to the Bible, when I have a revival of the Word, I go to the Word, and the Word tells me how I ought to think. The Word tells me how I ought to speak. The Word tells me to respect people. The Word teaches me how to live in this life. And yet so often, we're saying, Man, I, I want God to move, but He's got to fit my cute little box. There is not a box big enough that God could ever fit in. And yeah, I like God to get, well, I don't want God. You're weird. Wait a minute, we're going to have a church with Lady Gaga weird. People are going to love it. Not that weird. But think about it. All the time we, what are you allowing or not allowing God to revive in you? Guys, I, I love Jesus, but, oh, being faithful every Sunday to church. I just look at it this way, and this is just my simple, anybody simple-minded like I am? I'm just a simple-minded person. Here's why I look at it. If Jesus could hang up on a cross, bloody, beaten, and broken, to guarantee me heaven, and I can't show up to church, that tells me who. First service, I'm just saying that. Another word for uh, resuscitate is a word you'll know, resurrection. In order for something to breathe life in you, it must be resurrected. Resurrection is something that we typically only celebrate once a year. But the resurrection in the early church was something that was celebrated all the time. So here, let me just give you a few thoughts on resurrection. I just jotted down. Resurrection is not an event. It is a person. I think too often. You know when church is packed? Two times a year. The biggest Sunday of the year is Easter Sunday. Resurrection! The second biggest is Christmas. Birth. The only time most of Americans celebrate Jesus is when he was born and when he died. When he rose from the dead three days later. Here's the reality. Resurrection was never about an event in the Bible. How do we know that? Because Jesus testified this way. He said, I am the resurrection and the life. He didn't say, you're going to go to Ticketmaster and you're going to book your tickets at the resurrection. He said, you meet me, I am the resurrection. He went on to say that no one gets to the Father unless they come through the doorway of me, the resurrection. Oh, man, Jesus is the only way to heaven. There is no other way. And that's why moments like this where we're going into back to church Sunday are so important because your neighbors, your friends, unless they experience Jesus, if they die, they will spend a lifeless eternity in hell. That's why it matters. That's why resurrection can never be in about, oh, it's Easter Sunday. Let me put on my nice clothes. Got to put on my shoes, and I got to show up. No, you ought to show up 
in church because when you show up, guess who else is always here? God is here. And when you show up, he shows up. He shows off among us. See, resurrection's never been about an event. We've made it about the event instead of about the person. See, I don't celebrate the resurrection as an event. I celebrate it as a person in Jesus. He said, I am the resurrection and the life. See, if you want to have a revival in your heart, you've got to have Jesus resurrected in your soul. He's got to be so evident in your life that he spawns every decision. He directs every step. He orchestrates every part of your life. I don't want to just talk about the event. I want to experience the person. Every single day, it's about Jesus. Always, only Jesus. There is no other way to heaven but through Jesus. We need to make Jesus famous again. We need to make sure that everyone on Long Island hears adequately about the love of Jesus. Because I believe when God does what God does at our church, Long Island will show up to see what's happening. And it's not going to be contained to just a few people. I have a feeling this movement that we're about to walk into, get ready, Church Unleashed. Fasten your spiritual seatbelt. It's about to get bumpy. The ride is about to get fun. It's about to get exhilarating because you're going to see people experience things they've never experienced before in their life. You're going to see people walk into church. You'll see people walk into church. that You thought there's no way this person is going to surrender their life to Jesus. And they're going to literally at the invitation, they're going to be like, I need Jesus. And there's going to be people that come in, maybe wheelchair bound, maybe can't walk. And you're going to see people pray the prayer of faith. And the Bible says he will heal the sick. You're going to see miracles that you've never dreamed possible if we're all on the same page, heading in the same direction. See, revival, resurrection is not about an event. It's about a person. It's a person called Jesus. If Jesus isn't lifted up in a revival, it ain't no revival. It's always about Jesus. I also believe this. Resurrection is not a destination. It is an invitation. It's an invitation to experience the breath of God in your life. Romans 8, 11 says, yes, God has raised Jesus to life. Who raised Jesus to life? The Father did. And since God's spirit of resurrection lives in you, where is God's spirit today, church? His resurrection power is on the inside of your life. It is not just in the pastors. It's not in missionaries. It's not in worship leaders. It is in every person that believes in Jesus. The resurrection power is right inside me. Oh, but I need pastor to pray for me. I need, no, you don't need, you pray for yourself. Ask God, you have resurrection power on the inside of your life. It goes on to say, he will also raise your dying body to life by the same spirit that breathes. Where do you need God to breathe life into you? Where are you struggling? What are you going through? What hell have you stepped into that you need a touch from heaven to fix? What situation are you experiencing? Maybe today. Number eight, 2019 is the day God breathes into that situation. Maybe you're depressed, suicidal, and broken. Maybe today the breath of God breathes life into you brings life into you, vision to you, direction to you. Maybe you feel like walking out on your spouse. Maybe God breathes new love into your marriage today. Where do you need God to breathe? Maybe you're in debt over your head. You don't, you're drowning by all that stuff, and you're saying, God, I need... Maybe there's a miracle that God brings, a job promotion, an opportunity. You never know what God will do. That's why you must trust what he's doing behind the scenes. We just judge it by what we see, but God is always working behind the scenes. Resurrection is an invitation. It's an invitation to do what? Two things. First, for God to breathe life into you. Second, for you to breathe life into others. The church was not designed. Christianity was not designed so we could have a feel-good hoorah Sunday and go back to life as normal on Monday. It was designed for you and I to take the life that God has breathed into us and breathe into other people. 
to encourage other people, to lift up those who are broken, those who are lost, those who are discouraged. It is not about us just, woo, I had church. Church was so good today. Woo. Woo. And then you go to the restaurant and you give them a 2% tip, you cheapo. If God was good to you in church today, you take that invitation card, you tip that person 20 plus percent, and you invite them to experience hope, but do not give them an invite card if you're below 10%. Tell them you go to another church. Not, sorry. How many food industry people love me right now? I love you. Thank you. I see that hand in the back. It's an invitation to live again. It's an invitation to breathe life into other people. But also know this, resurrection is not a monument, it is a movement. There's a lot of people that think resurrection is a tag that you wear. I've been resurrected to new life. No, it is a lifestyle that you live. Every day of your life. I've been serving the Lord since I'm 17 and a half years old. No, I don't look that old, but 46. Do the math. And can I tell you this? I'm more passionate about Jesus today than I was at 17 and a half years old. I'm more excited about Jesus today than I was back then. See, when you live that God is moving in your life, there's no way you can return to normal. You can't go back and say, man, this was great back then, doing the stuff I used to do. Revival is never a tag. It's a lifestyle. It's who you are. It's what God's doing on the inside of your life. Colossians 3.1 says this, uh, Christ's resurrection is yours too. It's yours. That is why we yearn for all that is above. Wait a minute, check that out. Don't miss this. What Paul is telling the church at Colossae, he's saying this. Hey, when you experience resurrection, you don't think about this life as much as you think about heaven. Let me ask you today, what are you more focused on? Oh, man. 401k, more tank in this thing. My job, my this. Listen, all those things are important. None of them are wrong. But when they replace your yearning for heaven, they become a weight to keep you from the destiny God has for you. See, I think so often we're like, man, God, I'll go where you want me to go. Oh, but don't send me there. God, I'll say what you want me to say. Oh, but not to that person. Give me out of there. And I wonder how many times God is speaking into our lives, just moving in our hearts, and our yearning has not changed. Our desire has not changed. Let me tell you, any encounter with Jesus that does not change you was not an encounter with Jesus. Because every time you examine in Scripture that Jesus encountered people, they were forever changed, except religious people. Except the people that thought, I don't need... Who is this? Who is this? And they were so angry at Jesus, the religious, that they had him crucified. There will be people that won't understand you either. And they're going to want to take you out. The same spirit that raised Christ from the dead lives in you. They can knock you down, but they cannot take you out. Because you have resurrection power on the inside that forces you to yearn for the things of heaven, the things of God. Reading your Bible so excited. I love the Bible. I rarely miss a day of reading the Bible. I love it. I love enjoying it. I love sitting there in the morning, especially now with a nice, cool Long Island breeze. I love letting the Word speak to me. I wonder how many people are too enamored with CNN or Fox News that they don't even open up the Bible. What's happening in our culture? Let me tell you, moves of God don't happen in the White House. They happen in the church house. And, and not a political statement at all. And don't take it that way. And if you do, I don't know what's wrong with you. I don't care what happens in Washington. Because Washington doesn't shape my spiritual culture. I care what happens in God's house. I want to see a move of God that influences a region. And then maybe one day Washington will say, what is happening in the church I'm leading? 
maybe one of our future presidents. Maybe they'll want to experience that same move of God in their own life. Maybe our politicians, our educators. Wouldn't it be amazing if we saw this sweeping, reaping revival and not just influence the people in the church, but the people that know the people of our church. That their lives are impacted because of what God is doing in our lives. It says, hey, we yearn for all that is above, for that is where Christ sits enthroned at the place of, listen to this, all power, all honor, all authority. Now, do not miss this. The resurrection and our celebration of it forces us to remember who's in charge. All power is given to Jesus. That means there is no sickness that has ever existed that Jesus does not have the power to cleanse. There is nothing that you would ever expect. God has power over everything, all authority and all honor. There's a reason why our church is so diverse on every level. You want to know why? Because everyone, when they walk in here, they feel honored. We will always celebrate our uniqueness. See, revival is about unity. It is not about uniformity. It is not all about all of us being robots and all. No, it is about us recognizing the one commonality we all have is a person named Jesus. And if I've got Jesus and I've got my faith and I'm letting the word direct and dictate my life, then we may disagree on some things, but as long as I agree that this is the way, then there's nothing really to get in an argument about. Because I believe in this. See, resurrection is a movement of Jesus' power, honor, and authority. Revival is a movement of Jesus' power, honor, and authority. And when God does what he does, look out, Church Unleashed, because the church will truly be unleashed in this region. See, when you embrace the invitation from the person called Jesus, you automatically join the movement. How much of a key player do you want to be in the movement that God wants to do? That's got to be the question. I don't want to sit on the sidelines. When I played football in high school, I know I don't look it with my skinny jeans, but when I played football in high school, I was a wide receiver, very fast. Um, but the first few years, um, two years of Pop Warner, I was on the bench. Then there was this great invention called Stick'em. Anybody remember Stick'em? Put this little lubricant on your hand and the ball would just... Didn't even have to squeeze the ball. It just... And I was in there, I was in the game, I caught like a 25-yard pass in the middle of a crowd as my one hand went up. And I pulled the ball, next thing you know, I'm starting. It's like I'm thinking, I got the start because I cheated. I wonder how many people are looking for a start because they're doing the wrong thing. Instead of saying, God, I'm just going to be faithful where I'm at. I'm going to trust you in the process. Fast forward, when I transferred out of that into high school, Played football in high school, and uh, man, guess what? I was second string again. Boy, God was preparing me. Played second string my whole high school career. Caught just a few passes, one of the fastest guys on the team, but man, there were seniors ahead of me. When I went into ministry, guess what I played? Second string just about everywhere I went. Every place I was at, every place in ministry, I was the second in charge. And then God spoke to Mary and I 11 years ago and said, I want you to move from second string for the last 27 years to being the first string quarterback of the church called Church Unleashed. And I'll tell you, I look now at our church and just looking today, I look back to the curtain that we already moved back because more people keep coming. And I can't help but think, thank you for those years of being second string. Because that built something in me never give up and to always persevere. And one day, I thought I'd be Jerry Rice. That was my hope. Two things wrong. I wasn't black, didn't have his athletic ability. Crazy. But 
But God said, I'm not going to place you as a first string wide receiver, which was my ultimate life goal. God said, I'm going to place you first string as a quarterback on one of my teams in the church. You never know where God's going to take you. You never know the doors God is going to open up for you. You never know the difficulties you're facing. But my prayer has always been, but this prayer has resurfaced in me deeply. Lord, revive us again. Because at the end of our life, it's not going to matter all the stuff that we have, all the jobs we may or may not have survived or endured or enjoyed. What's going to matter is what we've done for Jesus. And so when we enter into heaven one day, all of us are going to hear this famous question. God is going to ask us, what did you do with Jesus? Yeah, but Jesus, I was too busy. Yeah, but Jesus, I, I had all that. And he's going to say, wait, whoa, whoa. What did you do with my son? I do not want to stand before God with excuses. Come on, church. I want to stand before God and say, God, I left it all on the field. I gave everything I had to you. Yeah, but no, but God, I am not offering you any excuse. I want to offer you the results of an effective life of ministry and service to your kingdom. And that is our prayer for every single person in our church. That when church unleashed, we enter into that eternal rest in heaven. We are so massive that we have our own mansion in heaven called Unleashed Avenue. That when we get there, there'll be lines and lines of people who've experienced the move of God in their life that changed their eternal destination. So we're believing over the next 21 days that God is going to do something supernatural in our life. 21 days significant in the Bible. So what we're doing is, for each of you, we're going to give you a free 21-day devotional. And here's how you're going to get it. Because we also love to hug trees, so no paper. Pull out your cell phone. <laughs> Sorry, bad joke. Pull out your cell phone, and you can actually text the word revival to the number on the screen. And you'll be immediately sent a 21-day devotional that you can download to your smartphone, your iPad. You can redirect it, email it to yourself. If you can't get signal, the signal in here is really bad. You'll get it after when you leave. But text the word revival and join us on this 21-day journey. Why is that important? Because the Bible says in Acts 2 that when God's Spirit first fell on that day of Pentecost, that they were all in unity. Each day you will read a scripture and read a devotional and say a prayer that the whole church will be saying together. I, I got to believe that if we're all going in the same direction, that God's going to do something really powerful. The Bible says where two or three are gathered in his name, he is there in the middle. He's in the midst of this. I don't want it to just be two or three or two or three hundred. I want it to be every single person at Church Unleashed saying, I'm ready. This is is revival. It all climaxes and culminates on September 29th when we all celebrate a day of worship with Mac Brock. I cannot think of a better way to conclude a 21-day journey as a church than in worship and prayer and His Word. What is God going to say and do in 21 days? I have no clue. But I do know he wants to speak. Because God often speaks to all of us, but then always speaks to individually. I want God to speak to you individually. I want him to speak to your life, give you a fresh vision, a fresh direction, a fresh hope. We're in the middle of what God wants to say and do, and I'm ready for whatever that looks like. There may be some weird moments. There may be some unique moments but there will be supernatural moments. There will be times where God shows up in ways that you walk out of a service saying, I can't believe what God just did in my life. So join us on that journey. We'll believe in 21 days, and we're going to see miracles in that 21 days. I want to see it in our church. I don't want to just read about it. I don't want to hear about it. I want to experience it. Story of 
D.L. Moody, or D.L. Moody, sorry, uh, Charles Finney, 1858. You know, New York has led some of the greatest revival America's ever seen. You know that, right? Uh, New York. 1858 was one of those. Charles Finney was invited to speak uh, revival services in Rochester, New York. He went to speak at the services in Rochester, New York. It was scheduled for two weeks. The revival ended up lasting one year. Every single night they were having church. Can you imagine that? You can't even get Long Islanders once a week. Every single night having church. At the end of that one-year journey, the Rochester Historical Society writes that every bar room, prostitute house, and place of employment closed down early so people could get to the revival services. What would happen if we experienced that again? That the move of God was so powerful that your boss, your co-workers, your friends, your families all of a sudden recognize, wait a minute, God is up to something. One year after that revival concluded, one million New Yorkers gave their lives to Jesus in one year. 3.1 million New Yorkers on Long Island. Less than 4% of them have a relationship with Jesus. That's a lot of people that need a move of God, man. I don't want to sit silently on the sidelines. I want to be in the game making a difference. And the beautiful thing about God's kingdom, you're all first stringers unless you choose to sit on the bench. Everyone gets to play a part in his plan unless you choose not to. Would you close your eyes as we pray today?